Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Legends of Smooth Jazz. Happy Saturday to all of you on this February 18th, 2023. Episode number six is upon us tonight and we're looking at a very, very wonderful man who been around in all of our memories because he himself passed away back in 1971 but he was born in 1901 but died too soon at the age of 69 and he was the most influential figures in jazz nicknamed Sachmo Satch and Pops and his career spanned five decades and several eras in the history of jazz. He received numerous accolades, including the Grammy Award for Best Male Vocal Performance for Hello Dolly in 1965, as well as a posthumous win for the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 1972 and in the induction into the National Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame in 2017. Born and raised in New Orleans, coming to prominence in the 1920s, as an inventive trumpet and coronet player, he was a foundational influence in jazz, shifting the focus of the music from collective improvisation to solo performance. We're going to look at him tonight. Louis Daniel Armstrong, otherwise known as Louis Armstrong, tonight on the Legends of Smooth Jazz. <laughs> To this great episode of Louis Armstrong, started to tribute this life. I'm your host, Jason DiCanio, and welcome you to the Legends of Smooth Jazz on this Saturday, February 18th, 2023. And I hope you had a grand, tremendous couple of weeks before that, because we are uh, last posted Lionel Hampton. And we've had a fantastic uh, running with that episode. But the big episode so far that has really graced everybody on the YouTube channel is the Buddy Rich episode. Still going close to almost 200 views at 179. And uh, it's getting getting a lot of, uh, yeah, it's getting a lot of, uh, a lot of views so far. But Lionel Hampton's episode from published uh, almost nine days ago, 21 views. And then we had the three-part series with uh, Miles Davis, and that got a 26-19-41 viewing. And we've just picked up our eighth subscriber. Thank you for subscribing. If you have not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do. We'll send you a link. And you may join our family of smooth jazz uh, enthusiasts as we look at tonight's episode of Louis Armstrong. Okay, so Armstrong was born in New Orleans on August 4th, 1901. His parents were Mary Estelle May Ann Albert and William Armstrong. Now, Mary Albert was from Boat. Louisiana or Boutte, Louisiana, and gave birth at home when she was about 16. Less than a year and a half later, they had a daughter, Beatrice, Mama Lucy Armstrong, who was raised by Albert. William Armstrong abandoned the family shortly thereafter. Louis Armstrong was raised by his grandmother until the age of five when he was returned to his mother. He spent his youth in poverty in a rough neighborhood known as the Battlefield on the southern section of Rampart Street. 
At six, he attended the Fisk School for Boys, a school that accepted black children in the racially segregated system of New Orleans. At the age of six, Armstrong lived with his mother and sister and worked for the Karnifskis, a family of Lithuanian Jews at their home. He would help their two sons, Morris and Alex, collect rags and bones and deliver coal. In 1969, while recovering from heart and kidney problems at Beth Israel Hospital in New York City, Armstrong wrote Louis Armstrong and the Jewish Family in New Orleans, L.A., the year of 1907, a memoir describing his time working for the Karnofsky family. Armstrong writes about singing Russian lullaby with the Karnofsky family when their baby son David was put to bed and credits the family with teaching him to sing from the heart. Curiously, Armstrong quotes lyrics for it that appear to be the same as the Russian lullaby copyrighted by Irving Berlin in 1927, about 20 years after Armstrong remembered singing it as a child. Gary Zucker, Armstrong's doctor at Beth Israel Hospital in 1969, shared Berlin's song lyrics with him, and Armstrong quoted them in the memoir. This inaccuracy may simply be because he wrote the memoir over 60 years after the events described. Regardless, the Karnofskis treated Armstrong extremely well. Knowing he lived without a father, they fed and nurtured him. In his memoir, Louis Armstrong and the Jewish Family in New Orleans, Louisiana, the year of 1907, he described his discovery that this family was also subject to discrimination by other white folks who felt that they were better than the Jews. I was only seven years old, but I could easily see the ungodly treatment that the white folks were handing the poor Jewish family whom I worked for. He wrote about what he learned from them, how to live, real life, and determination. His first musical performance may have been at the side of the Karnofsky's junk wagon. To distinguish them from other hawkers, he tried playing a tin horn to attract customers. Morris Konofsky gave Armstrong an advance toward the purchase of a cornet from a pawn shop. Armstrong wore a Star of David until the end of his life in memory of this family who had raised him. When Armstrong was 11, he dropped out of school. His mother moved into a one-room house on Perdido Street with Armstrong, Lucy, and her common-law husband, Tom Lee, next door to her brother, Ike, and his two sons. Armstrong joined a quartet of boys who sang in the streets for money. He also got into trouble. Cornetist Bunk Johnson said he taught the 11-year-old to play by ear at Dago Tony's Honky Tonk. In his later years, Armstrong credited King Oliver. He said about his youth, Every time I close my eyes blowing that trumpet of mine, I look right in the heart of good old New Orleans. It has given me something to live for. Borrowing his stepfather's gun without permission, he fired a blank into the air and was arrested on December 31st of 1912. He spent the night at New Orleans Juvenile Court, then was sentenced the next day to detention at the colored wife's home. Life at the home was Spartan. Mattresses were absent. Meals were often little more than bread and molasses. Captain Joseph Jones ran the home like a military camp and used corporal punishment. Armstrong developed his cornet skills by playing in the band. Peter Davis, who frequently appeared at the home at the request of Captain Jones, became Armstrong's first teacher and chose him as band leader. With this band, the 13-year-old Armstrong attracted the attention of Kid Ori. Now, on June 14th of 1914, Armstrong was released into the custody of his father and his new stepmother, Gertrude. He lived in this household with two stepbrothers for several months. After Gertrude gave birth to a daughter, Armstrong's father never welcomed him, so he returned to his mother, Mary Albert. In her small home, he had to share a bed with his mother and sister. His mother still lived in the battlefield, leaving him open to old temptations, but he sought work as a musician. He found a job at a dance hall owned by Henry Ponce, who had connections to organized crime. He met the six-foot-tall drummer, Black Benny, who became his guide and bodyguard. Around the age of 15, he pimped for a prostitute named Nutsi. 
But that relationship failed after she stabbed Armstrong in the shoulder and his mother choked her nearly to death. He briefly studied shipping management at the local community college, but was forced to quit after being unable to afford the fees. And while selling coal in Storyville, he heard spasm bands, groups that played music out of household objects. He heard the early sounds of jazz from bands that played in brothels and dance halls, such as Pete Lala's where King Oliver performed. Early in his career, Armstrong played in brass bands and river boats in New Orleans, first on an excursion boat in September of 1918. He traveled with the band of Fateh Marable, which toured on the steamboat Sydney with the Strefuckus uh, Steamers, or the Strefuckus Steamers lineup, and down the Mississippi River. Marable was... Uh, was proud of his musical knowledge, and he insisted that Armstrong and other musicians in his band learn sight reading. Armstrong described his time with Marable as going to the university since it gave him a wider experience working with written arrangements. In 1919, Armstrong's mentor, King Oliver, decided to go north and resigned his position in Kid Ory's band. Armstrong replaced him, and he also became second trumpet for the Tuxedo Brass Band. Throughout his riverboat experience, Armstrong's musicianship began to mature and expand. At 20, he could read music, and he became one of the first jazz musicians to be featured on extended trumpet solos, injecting his own personality and style. He also started singing in his performances. In 1922, Armstrong moved to Chicago at the invitation of King Oliver, Although Armstrong would return to New Orleans periodically for the rest of his life, playing second cornet to Oliver in Oliver's Creo Jazz Band in the black-only Lincoln Gardens in Chicago's black neighborhood. He could make enough money to quit his day jobs. And although race relations were poor, Chicago was booming. The city had jobs for blacks making good wages at factories with some leftover for entertainment. Oliver's band was among the most influential jazz bands in Chicago in the early 20s. Armstrong lived luxuriously in his own apartment with his first private bath. Excited as he was to be in Chicago, he began his career-long pastime of writing letters to friends in New Orleans. Armstrong could blow 200 high C's in a row. As his reputation grew... He was challenged to cutting contests by other musicians. His first studio recordings were with Oliver for Gannett Records on April 5th to the 6th of 1923. They endured several hours on the train to remote Richmond, Indiana, and the band was paid little. The quality of the performances was affected by lack of rehearsal, crude recording equipment, bad acoustics, and a cramped studio. These early recordings were true acoustic, the band playing directly into a large funnel connected directly to the needle, making the groove in the master recording. Electrical recording was not invented until 1926, and Gannett installed it later. Because Armstrong's playing was so loud, when he played next to Oliver, Oliver could not be heard on the recording. Armstrong had to stand 15 feet away from Oliver in a far corner of the room. Lil Hardin, who Armstrong would marry in 1924, urged Armstrong to seek more prominent billing and develop his style apart from, his, from the influence of Oliver. At her suggestion, Armstrong began to play classical music in church concerts to broaden his skills, and he began to dress more in more stylish attire to offset his girth. Her influence eventually undermined Armstrong's relationship with his mentor, especially concerning his salary and additional money that Oliver held back from Armstrong and other band members. Armstrong's mother, May Ann Albert, came to visit him in Chicago during the summer of 1923 after being told that Armstrong was out of work, out of money, hungry, and sick. Harden located and decorated an apartment for her to live in while she stayed. Armstrong and Oliver parted amicably in 1924. 
Shortly afterward, Armstrong received an invitation to go to New York City to play with Fletcher Henderson, with the Fletcher Henderson Orchestra, the top African-American band of the time. He switched to the trumpet to blend in better with the other musicians in his section. His influence on Henderson's tenor sax soloist, Coleman Hawkins, can be judged by listening to the records made by the band during this period. Armstrong adapted to the tightly controlled style of Henderson, playing trumpet and experimenting with the trombone. The other members were affected by Armstrong's emotional style. His act included singing and telling tales of New Orleans characters, especially preachers. The Henderson Orchestra played in prominent venues for white patrons only, including the Roseland Ballroom, with arrangements by Don Redman. Duke Ellington's orchestra went to Roseland to catch Armstrong's performances. During this time, Armstrong recorded with Clarence Williams, a friend from New Orleans, the Williams Blue Five, Sidney Bechet, and the blues singers Alberta Hunter, Ma Rainey, and Bessie Smith. Then in 1925, Armstrong returned to Chicago, largely at the assistance of Lil, who wanted to expand his career and his income. In publicity, much to his chagrin, she billed him as the world's greatest trumpet player. And for a time, he was a member of the Lil Hardin Armstrong Band and working for his wife. He formed Louis Armstrong and his Hot Five and recorded the hits Potato Head Blues and Muggles. The word muggles was a slang term for marijuana, something he used often during his life. The Hot Five included Kid Ori on trombone, Johnny Dodds on clarinet, Johnny St. Cyr on banjo, Lil Armstrong on piano, and usually no drummer. Over a 12-month period starting in November of 1925, this quintet produced 24 records. Armstrong's band leading style was easygoing, as St. Cyr noted. One felt so relaxed working with him, and he was very broad-minded always did his best to feature each individual. Among the hot five and seven records were Cornet Chop Suey, Struttin' with Some Barbecue, Hotter Than That, and Potato Head Blues, all featuring highly creative solos by Armstrong. And according to Thomas Brothers, the recordings such as Struttin' with Some Barbecue were so superb, planned with density and variety, bluesness, and showiness, the arrangements were probably showcased at the Sunset Cafe. His recordings soon after with pianist Ernel Father Hines, their famous 1928 Weatherbird duet, and Armstrong's trumpet introduction to and solo in West End Blues remain some of the most influential improvisations in jazz history. Young trumpet players across the country bought these recordings and memorized his solos. Armstrong was now free to develop his personal style as he wished, which included a heavy dose of effervescent jive such as Whip That Thing, Miss Lil, and Mr. Johnny Dodds, Aw, oh, Do That Clarinet Boy. And we'll stop right there. <laughs> And pick up next week with part two of the history of the legend of Louis Armstrong right here on the Legends of Smooth Jazz. I'm Jason Ecanio, thanking you for a great time here. Hope you're enjoying this program as we are bringing it to you every week on this Saturday and some Saturdays. Sometimes we'll have a little break in between. But in the meantime, you get to look back Enjoy these parts as we look at them continuously. And next week we'll pick up with uh, part two where we'll look uh, at, at his still in his career and then go to the Harlem Renaissance and then emerging as a vocalist, working during the hard times, and so on and so forth. We'll pick up so far as how far we got to get to from there couple of things. Uh, one thing I want to mention before I end the program tonight. If you do comment on this channel or any of the channels that I host, uh, please do be kind and uh, keep your comments to the topics on hand. 
uh, I would appreciate that. And I so would think that if you're going to take the time to write a comment that's going to criticize me, I would rather you do it in private, okay? Sometimes, uh, be, uh, because at this point, uh, one of my subscribers, and I have not subscribed back, and I don't know if it's a real channel or not, says my pronunciation is way off on certain things, on especially on the Buddy Rich episode. So I went back and listened to the pronunciations on the Buddy Rich episode, and for your honest... Uh, feedback, Mr. S such and such, who did not like my pronunciations. I couldn't find anything wrong with the pronunciations. I did my best. I'm going to, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You don't like it? I'm sorry, but unfortunately, your comment was reported, and your channel is blocked. You are still a subscriber, but future comments will not be approved unless you start changing your tune that's all i can tell you if you have not subscribed to the channel please do so we would love to hear from you we'd love to have you in support of our great show and if you have a specific uh legend of smooth jazz you would like us to talk about in the near future on our program drop us a line we'd love to hear from you from all of us here and i do mean all of us that means those who are in the Facebook group page and those who are planning on joining us later on in times of when they get a chance to uh, subscribe. From all of us here at the Legends of Smooth Jazz, I'm Jason DeCanio. Have a great weekend. We will see you next week. Bye for now.
Don't forget to subscribe to the Demon Thousand Network for great more content like this one.